I start with a short introduction. I'm uh, happy to welcome my colleagues here. And I start, of course, with the ladies, Emma Hackel from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, Gunilla Herold from the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, and Niklas Bremberg from the University of Stockholm and also the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. I'm very happy and thankful that you found the time today for this discussion that we have on an absolutely pertinent topic and that climate politics unveiled European, Finnish and Swedish perspectives. My name is Johannes Pollock. I'm a professor of political science in Vienna. And I have to particularly thank the organizers for finding such a youthful picture of myself uh, that was sent out. Now, I just mentioned what the topic is today. I think we couldn't be more in the uh, CUP28 starting in Dubai very soon. More importantly, like me, some of you might have experienced a summer of uh, record-breaking heat. I do think that uh, even the most optimistic amongst us do no longer believe that we can ever achieve the Paris objective, that they are reachable. This 1.5 degrees seems to be going into the very, very distant uh, future. Now, the latest study from the United Nations um, report, the report on the so-called emissions gap report, rather talks about 2.5 to 2.9 degrees increase. Uh, they're almost certain about that. Inga Andersen, who is the head of the environment program of the UN, says that this decade is the decisive one. I do think we all have heard that very often that this decade is the decisive one and time is running out. Uh, I think for the first time we are feeling the impact of the climate change in, in reality already. Um, so I think, as I said, a very topical uh, um, topic that we are dealing with today. Um, in order, that's what Anderson says, in order to avoid catastrophe, we have to decrease the envisaged, envisaged emissions till to 2030. Uh, we have to reduce them by 28 to 42 uh, percent. That's an enormous amount, especially if you think that 21 to 22, we face actually an increase of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. All of you being experts in the topic, you all know that the European Union has given itself uh, quite an objective by wanting to be the first climate neutral continent by 2050. Pardon my skepticism, I am also old enough to remember the Lisbon agenda where the Commission said we want to be the most knowledge based society uh, of the world. Um, didn't really uh, pan out the way it was planned. The question for us also today is, are we in the same danger? Are we announcing something that is neither with technological progress or with the reductions uh, demanded possible? Okay. Uh, is the Green Deal the European Union offers? What is the specific Scandinavian or Nordic, Finnish, Swedish perspective on the topic? of uh, greening our industry, of, of, of achieving these necessary uh, transitions. Of course, the first block of our discussion deals with the politicization, it's a difficult word, politicization, of um, the question uh, of climate change. Are our politicians even capable of making the necessary uh, decisions or not? So this is broadly the horizon that we want to discuss. It's not really a small topic. Um, a couple of ground rules. We start with short and crisp and hopefully provocative statements by our speakers. We start with the first block. Uh, Niklas is starting, followed by Emma. After this, we have a short Q&A. Please ask your questions in the chat. I will make sure that uh, I will summarize them and then also ask the um, discussions here uh, to answer them. And also a reminder, please, this is uh, a discussion that is recorded. With this, I'd like to ask Niklas to go ahead and start. Uh, please go ahead, Niklas. Thank you very much, Johannes. Thank you for, for hosting this, this webinar. And also thank you to Gunilla and the organizer for, for, for inviting me. And it's uh, a pleasure, obviously, to be here also with, with Emma uh, on, on um, the panel. So this is 
is very, I mean, this is um, um, set up to be a very good, good, I think, discussion. So, uh, Johannes, I'd like to say basically two things to start us off on the theme of politicization. And one relates to kind of the changing role of the EU when it comes to climate diplomacy, climate leadership as, as a concept that the EU has been, been kind of uh, wanting to use uh, to describe itself and its, uh, its action when it comes to, to kind of climate policy internationally. And then uh, something, a reflection on what we are seeing uh, more broadly in, in, um, in Europe and in, in, in various member states around the issue of uh, climate climate um, policy. So I think kind of link those two things together. And if we start by then the kind of the, the, the changing role of the EU when it comes to climate and diplomacy, and as you said, we have uh, COP28 just around the, the corner. We have seen what the, uh, the EU and its member states have been, been able to agree on in terms of negotiating uh, mandates for for the COP28, and it is something that obviously, uh, you know, it, it, it goes along uh, the lines that we expect, basically, from the EU by this uh, by this time, right? It is something, it, 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 the negotiating mandates pay, um, puts a heavy emphasis on, uh, you know, the EU uh, wanting to contribute to um, an increased use of renewable energy, in order to try to get to uh, you know uh, some of the you know uh, ambitious uh, objectives of the Paris Agreement, even though, as you said, also of course a lot of the, the kind of climate expertise and knowledge on the on the topic is is, is pointing towards an, a scenario where the Paris Agreement is going to be increasingly difficult to to of course uh, achieve. But the EU is very much committed to make. Uh, as the EU is saying, like um, the Paris Agreement work. Um, so we're on the ha one hand seeing that. At the same time as we are seeing um, a lot of discussion around the, you know, the EU's model of doing climate policy. You mentioned the, the, the Green Deal. We have seen Fit for uh, 55 when we have seen a lot of what the current commission had it's ambitious when it took office um, under the helm of, of Ursula von der Leyen, and, and particularly when, when it comes to the European Green Deal, it has now basically kind of been translated into the, the European climate law and, of course, the whole Fit for 55 package. But it is a, 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 a model of doing climate um, action that is very heavy on regulation and setting standards that is very much kind of deep uh, ingrained into the EU's um, kind of uh, mode of, of policy making uh, in, in this field and over the years and, and particularly uh, as after Biden come to power in the US there has been a lot of more discussion around whether there are other ways of, of actually taking a lead on, on, on climate issues and be less focused on regulation and much more forward leaning on um, subsidies uh, tax tax cuts um, and other ways to basically kind of um, spearhead and and maybe uh, change the, the 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 current equilibrium when it comes to energy sources renewables uh, new technology whatever it is so I think that is something that also take we have to take into account when we try to think about the role that the EU is is is, is playing in this broader international setting when it comes to 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 climate negotiations, uh, m m issues on mitigation, but also, of course, adaptation. Um, and that also kind of, uh, I think, is something that we need to keep in mind, or at least put on the table for our discussion, is that um, whenever there is talk about climate leadership, obviously, the, the EU wants to pre present itself as a model. It, it points to, uh, it. basically, it's kind of, it's, it's policy, um, Packages that it has been able to to uh, um, agree on, um, but it also is the case that when it comes to these uh, negotiations, um, that Europe's and the EU's share of global emission is not high, and it's going down in a sense, which is on the one hand good, but it also um, kind of creates the, the somewhat paradoxical situation where the kind of the EU's weight around the negotiation table is at the same time declining. So the EU needs to work very much on the kind of the quote unquote 
soft issues to to get um, other uh, players in the uh, in in the climate negotiations to kind of um, uh, play ball in a sense. And of course, it is a little bit inspiring and a little bit um, uh, hopeful that the U.S. and China seem to be back uh, on a better um, talking terms ahead of this COP than it was just a year or two years ago. But that is something I think uh, we need to kind of take into account that kind of the changing role, the, the increased sense that maybe the, the, the way in which the EU has been doing climate policy, so to speak, has, 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 has run its course and maybe it has to shift gears also when it comes to um, you know, uh, economic uh, incentives rather than, than, than regulations, which is difficult obviously for the EU to do. I think there is a big thing to discuss when it comes to adaptation, but I also know that Emma is is an expert on when it comes to climate and, and security issues. So I'll, I'll I'll leave that for her if she wants to pick that up. Otherwise, I'm happy to come back to that. Um, and then I'd like to say something uh, about kind of the the issue of politicization, Johanna. Since you 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 brought that up in your introduction, and this is basically a reflection on my my side that we are now seeing a situation that is somehow a little bit uh, unusual maybe uh, if you know compared to uh, 10 years ago where climate was still maybe perceived as a very technical issue uh, it was something that some people cared a lot about but most people did not care that much about uh, kind of the same as as maybe environmental issues now of course the the level of politicization around climate and particularly from um, the right uh, side of, of the uh, political spectrum in Europe, and particularly populist right and far right parties, are politicizing the issue of climate. Um, the you know, ranging from you know denying that climate um, policy or climate change is um, um, is, is man made to other ways of kind of criticizing uh, climate action by saying that you know Europe can't save the world. Um, this is something that China and, and other countries need to do much more about. Uh, Europe is already doing what what it can, and it's uh, unfair that normal people in Europe has to to um, bear the the cost and burden of of climate, and the kind of transition into to in, into a new um, uh, equilibrium uh, around climate and, and and energy and i think that is something that we are seeing in a whole range of countries in in europe which is also something new you saw it uh, very much in the spanish elections if anyone remembers that before the summer um and it looked like the um, the, the the big uh, right of center party partido popular uh, with the uh, extreme right box was set to win those elections, but didn't happen. So now we have a, um, a left-leaning um, coalition in place in Spain and very kind of um, uh, true to style. Climate change is, is kind of back on the agenda of Spanish politics on a kind of a predict, in a progressive sense, so to speak. Uh, whereas we saw, for instance, now in the Dutch election where uh, Gert Wilders are, uh, and his party uh, made made uh, uh, big gains, and then of course there is a huge uncertainty of of you know what what the next Dutch uh, government is going to do when it comes to uh, uh, the, the Dutch climate policies and and kind of the ambitions of the Netherlands. Also, of course, ahead of of the European um, elections um, in in the spring, and we're going to come back to Sweden and Finland uh, for the next block. But of course we. Same thing for for Sweden with a with a right of of center coalition backed by the by the Sweden uh, Democrats in Sweden has also changed Swedish position on, when it comes to to climate change and um, uh, has has basically uh, toned down the the ambitions in terms of of um, emission reductions for 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 Sweden and there has been a lot of discussion and uncertainty around where uh, Sweden is going to go next. In, in its climate climate policy. So I think that's also something that we really need to put into a table, of course. And I guess for us in this, you know, the TEPSA setting, we are very much uh, discussing and and and, and debating uh, how this this changes that we see in a number of member states um, is, is going to translate into 
the new uh, commission uh, that is going to uh, take office after the European elections next year. And of course, what is also happening in the European elections uh, to the, uh, the election to the European Parliament is going to uh, play a, a big role in this too. So I just want to put those things uh, on the table, uh, increased politicization and the changing role of the EU when it comes to uh, climate negotiations and climate diplomacy is something for that, that I think we should uh, definitely look out for and, and maybe uh, discuss more. Thank you. Many thanks, Nicholas, for uh, this first input. Uh, I have already five questions down on my list, uh, but before I continue, Emma, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, talking to you and, and with you. Uh, and thanks, Nicholas, for the really uh, good opening, opening uh, thoughts and, and, uh, and speech. Uh, I think that there's a lot that I could <laughs> pick up there, uh, and, and maybe we can talk uh, a bit more still in the in the di discussion. But I thought that actually, uh, and being uh, as you mentioned, I, I come very much from this sort of, sort of climate security point of view. I think actually there is this, even though I don't want to overly uh, securitize this uh, discussion, I think that there are in in both of those uh, sort of main topics that you raised. I think that there is this interesting security element as as well uh, and and one of them of course is the the uh, eu's role as this climate uh, leader uh, and i think that what is interesting and important there uh, to understand is that uh, it has also meant that eu i i think has understood that as, at a re relatively early stage that um climate change and its mitigation are also geopolitical issues and, and also these kind of global security issues in really many ways. And I don't think that uh, necessarily the EU has succeeded at, at tackling all of those, but I think that even the, the fact that already in 2016 uh, in, the, in the European Union's uh, global strategy, uh, this climate change topic was raised as a very sort of crucial issue. I think that was a very important sort of at least symbolic uh, uh, kind of gesture, um, which then I think that we can discuss whether that has actually led to a lot of action and, and what kind of action it has, has led to. Uh, of course, the EU has worked on climate security uh, and has also mentioned it and, and integrated it into the strategic compass, for example, and it has developed this uh, climate uh, security and defense roadmap. Uh, so there have been really efforts, but maybe in the in the ground, for example, if you look at the uh, common security uh, and defense policy missions, uh, where the attempt has, has been to uh, integrate these environmental advisors into the missions, I think that that work is still very much uh, kind of unfinished, but of course it's, it's ongoing. So uh, something is happening, but maybe the steps are just relatively low. Uh, and also with the, with regard to the sort of global activity of the EU, I think that even with this recognition of the sort of geopolitical aspects of climate change, I think that the EU has sometimes maybe failed a little bit to kind of communicate its, its climate policies uh, sort of in the internal climate policies that are are being implemented in the EU uh, to the outside because sometimes of course they have been perceived as somehow uh, either sort of uh, outsourcing the the problems the environmental problems and the emissions uh, to the rest of the world or then somehow protectionists for example with the with the um, uh, climate border adjustment uh, mechanism I know that this, it has sparked a lot of criticism uh, in the in the rest of the world, and, and this doesn't necessarily mean that these would be somehow poor policies, uh, but maybe there is still more of a role for this kind of dialogue with the rest of the world and with partners. I, I think it has been actually mentioned as an important uh, element of the use sort of external climate uh, engagement, but maybe that then hasn't happened quite to the to the extent that it it could be doing so and it would be interesting to hear also your comments on on that and then briefly on the other point of um, politicization sort of within the countries and within the eu um, i think in a way of course 
climate change and climate policy, like any policy, kind of needs to be also politicized uh, to some extent. I mean, it's it's natural that it's uh, uh, it's not always uh, clear, and there is a need for kind of fair discussion about what are the best uh, policies to to mitigate climate change and and what kinds of policies will have what kinds of effects on specific groups of people and so on. Uh, but then exactly this kind of politicization and, and maybe polarization uh, of the of the issue that you mentioned, Nicholas, um, with ex especially the extreme right, uh, I, I think that it it still continues somehow to be, even though it's maybe shifted from this uh, completely de denying climate change, but I think that the, often these arguments are still not very constructive in the sense that uh, that they would be even trying to understand and what what are we supposed to do or proposing any sort of uh, mechanisms to uh, to mitigate climate change so i think that there is still is an element of of kind of just trying to maybe uh, hinder the discussion more than than to actually propose something uh, new uh, and of course that's very difficult or it can be difficult to to respond to uh, i think of course and it it uh, puts a kind of an extra responsibility on ensuring that we actually have a coordinated climate policy and, and, and just climate policy so that at least we wouldn't, with the policies that we are proposing, we wouldn't somehow contribute to this inequality or, or other sort of polarizing elements in the, in the society. Um, but I'm also really interested and, and kind of, uh, perhaps a little bit nervous about the upcoming European elections from this point of view, because on the other hand, like I think you also mentioned, Niklas, that uh, the EU's role still as a climate leader also within Europe has been so uh, so important. So if the, if the political mood changes completely in the Commission and so on, then we might be, be in a different situation. But that, of course, we will, we will soon see. Uh, but I think I'll stop there and, and leave room for the discussion. Uh, thank you. Nicholas, please, you have a, a, obviously a direct <laughs> comment. Can I, can I uh, respond quickly? Thank you, Johannes. So Emma, thank you very much. Um, great points. Just two things I, I, I'd like to add since you kind of put them uh, on the table for us. First is, um, I think you're very uh, correct in kind of identifying this uh, Something that, of course, in, in, in kind of in political science and in EU studies, we, we usually kind of go to uh, uh, analytically kind of pointing to that there is this kind of uh, a gap between mm, policy formation or policy ambition and, and, and implementation. That is obviously, you know, not uncommon. That's usually the case, but it is uh, peculiar maybe in, in this particular setting, as you say, uh, Emma, that the EU has been um, you know, uh, formulating uh, an, an, a discussion on the security consequences of, of, of climate change for, for quite some time. It kind of goes back, obviously, to the global strategy and, 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 and further back uh, too, right? So, uh, and, and still, we're still, uh, you know, seeing pretty modest implementations in terms of, you know, what we are seeing in in, for instance, the, the, the European Union's foreign and, and security policy, there is maybe an, you know, an, 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 an climate advisor to a CSDP mission, and there is more of, of uh, kind of officials uh, 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 cooperating between the EU and the, the UNEP and, 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 and that kind of stuff, which is obviously important and, and, and makes sense, but it's, it, it, it is very much on a you know, low or at the lower end of the spectrum in terms of, of resources and, and, and manpower, even though the, the question is, is um, admittedly very, very big. And as Johannes said in the beginning, um, you know, if we're facing uh, 2.5 or even 3 degrees of, 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 of warming uh, by the end of the century, obviously we're going to live in a very different world um, uh, and not only then I mean it, that it's probably going to happen uh, sooner so it, it, it's a huge a huge undertaking obviously to uh, to think about the building a more resilient and uh, societies and and also not only for for Europe but also for 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 um, partners in, in other parts of, of the world um, and then the um, the issue of um, 
I think you're very, and I, I think your observation about kind of politicization is not bad. It is, it's not bad. It's obviously something that, that, that all democratic societies uh, need. We need to have, uh, you know, discussions on uh, the effects of of certain um, decisions and uh, you know how to best address societal problems. So that is part of, of politicization. What is obviously um, uh, not as uh, productive is when certain issues tend to become framed or used by political actors in in very uh, particular particular ways. So yes, I think you're absolutely right that maybe the mistake up until this point was to not think about the distributional effects or of, of, of climate policies and how to ensure that broad segments of European societies are, are, are on board with the transitions. And of course, it, you know, if you reduce this to lifestyle choices or you know, individuals have to, have to basically change their lives, it's gonna be more complicated rather than you think about this as a, as, as a collective commitment that we do as, as, as societies. And then, the flip side is, of course, when you get to a point when the, you know, certain actors on on the right are are basically lumping climate together with a lot of other stuff that they, you know, dislike uh, with liberal democracies or liberal values. You are entering a difficult situation because it's 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 going to be hard to 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 kind of develop sensible policies um, and 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 have broad support for. For climate policies, if if large or larger segment, not large, but maybe larger segments of your societies are thinking that this is just, you know, um, something that the liberal elites uh, tell us to to do. So yes, I think, but that's a very good point that you know, politicization and, and uh, polarization is are, are obviously two things. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, I would like to invite the audience also to post their questions in the in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I try to be the thorn in the side of Nicholas uh, and Emma, and, and also ask a couple of questions, taking up the first one that you said, which is kind of weird that you see this unholy alliance between uh, skepticism towards science, uh, which really came to the fore uh, during the COVID pandemic. Now you have the right picking up on uh, all those climate activists, the younger people, you know, disrupting traffic and all that kind of stuff. and. How can the honest, in our case, the honest Austrian, pay the price for that? So that they are not doing a kind of climate leadership, but they're following the loudest voices, uh, so to say, which is, of course, disheartening thinking about all the different elections coming up uh, within Europe uh, in the future. But one point we haven't touched upon now is um, the energy transition. I'm going to list a couple of questions to you. The en energy transition or the, 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 the climate transition, the greening of our industry, et cetera. Uh, can, we, can we achieve that without sacrificing too much of the lavish lifestyle we in the West have become very accustomed to? Let's not forget that even within the European Union, you have millions of energy poor people, okay? And this has not become easier uh, since the invasion of Ukraine uh, by Russia. So can we achieve that? Okay, I mean, if you are a believer in technology, you can lean back and say, I'm, I'm pretty sure that humankind is adaptable and we will find a solution. And of course, right now, we again see a discussion popping up about CO2 storage right in front before we have the, uh, the COP28 meeting starting. So can we do that? Can we achieve it? What is necessary? How much money do we have to pour into this topic in order not to leave those behind who are already in a disadvantaged uh, situation? That would be my first question. And without giving too much way to the right-wing populists that we see popping up everywhere. And all of us know that the climate and security issue is always nowadays connected to the migration issue, yeah? uh, which is a home run uh, for the right-wing parties in Europe. My second question would be a topic that I would like to address is how credible is the European Union? I hear a lot about this uh, climate diplomacy and so on, but I also remember very much once Russia invaded the Ukraine, how quickly individual member states of the European Union embarked on their planes going to different suppliers all of them or most of them in the Middle East, not really democratic regimes, trying to secure in this first shock reaction 
that there's an uninterrupted supply either via LNG or oil tankers, whatever. It is impressive from my point of view how much the EU has reduced dependency on a, a Russian gas. Uh, but on the other hand, there was no reaction that says, okay, one third we have to save, period. That's it. We cannot continue the way we are doing it. At the same time, Europe is lecturing other states, telling them, look, guys, you have to also do your homework. We enjoyed our lavish lifestyle that I mentioned long before. You know, We enjoyed it for the past 50 years. So sorry, we will never get to this kind of developmental stage. You have to start saving right now. So how credible are we really? Now, I mentioned the, the third topic. I mentioned the invasion uh, of Ukraine. How much does this have an impact? Because what I observed was very quickly, the climate issue was no longer on the top of the agenda. It suddenly was all about, okay, what can we do to ensure energy security for Europe? And only later the voices came in that we need to apply long-term thinking, okay? But how, how big was the impact on um, the political class, so to say? Saying, okay, this, this whole climate thing is nothing I can win elections upon right now. It's all about the Ukrainian uh, war, so to say. Uh, what can be done uh, there? How big was the impact is a question to you. Yeah. A question mainly for Emma, I would have, is you said, found it very interesting, the EU failed to communicate, which basically says what Nicholas said about the EU climate policy. We're not really good at that because we failed to communicate internally and externally yeah it's also connected to the question of credibility you know, if you can't communicate you can't be an effective negotiator or diplomat so why do we fail is it the usual explanation because there are divergent interests within the european union is, is that the case yeah? is it the case that well not all people are utterly convinced and you know i'm under quotation mark by marriage half american and i see the climate discussion over there which is absolutely nuts and crazy yeah so but there's a lot of people are not convinced that this is not just another uh, spike so to say and nothing bad about the warming at least it's not as cold any longer and so on and so forth you know so question is how did we fail to communicate how could we allow that there is this enormous skepticism toward science. Because if you look at the talk shows across Europe, what you witness is an incredibly disbelief in what established researchers are telling us, okay? Uh, so how can we rectify uh, this, uh, for instance? Yeah, so I leave it at that. I'm talking way too long already and would invite you to, and of course, also Gunilla, if you, if you wanna come back with your thoughts to that. Whoever wants to start. Emma, should you go first, maybe? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I can I can go first. I can try to be quite uh, fast, and maybe I'll let uh, Nicholas tackle the more difficult questions <laughs> or, or give <laughs> actual solutions. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, really good questions, also really big ones that I I will not. Uh, and that I, I'm really wondering about myself as well to, to some extent, so we can maybe try to solve them uh, together now. Um, but first of all, I guess maybe to the point of uh, can we achieve a green transition um, with all of the or with, with our, I, I guess, current lifestyles and, and without kind of changing our ways of, of life too much. Uh, and in a way, surprisingly, because I'm usually a pessimist, but in a way, I think that that it is quite possible. Um, for example, I'm a member of this, uh, also of this uh, BIOS research group here in Finland, where we have been trying to sketch out these pathways of um, uh, living within the planetary boundaries or, or uh, within the, the limits that we have to in order to mitigate climate change. Uh, and of course, it's a it's a huge task where we have to uh, kind of uh, adopt uh, very new ways of producing things and 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 really change the society and even some cultural aspects and and so on. So it's a very comprehensive change that we would have to implement. 
but at least on paper and in theory, I think that it's it's possible. We have technical solutions, and often we have very good plans for different, for example, um, industries and and sectors of society about what we should do. But the problem, I think, is that um, well, first of all, we still are over consuming very much, as you Johannes mentioned, and I think that's one issue where we maybe have to figure out what is overconsumption and what we just consider um, something that is kind of uh, that we just want to have and, and to consume uh, and maybe we do have to give up on like the worst excesses that we are are doing right now uh, so that's one thing and then I think that we should talk a lot more you're very right that we should talk a lot more about consuming uh, I mean, uh, saving uh, energy and energy uh, efficiency, and uh, and because I think that there are still very many kind of low hanging fruit uh, there that we we could do. Uh, but then, what I also think that we would need uh, is this: uh, not just throwing money at something, but actually managing the the transition and and also coordinating it. And, and doing it in a very sort of uh, comprehensive way, which I know that everyone always says, but but we need some kind of sort of oversight because it is such a huge task where we also have all kinds of trade-offs and uh, kind of um, sort of discrepancies between different sectors where if you do something on the forestry sector, then you can't necessarily, you don't have all the resources for the energy sector and, and so on. So we would actually need to have this sort of complete situational awareness uh, and also somehow direct the, the uh, plan, the transition in a coordinated way. And I think that that's our only, only chance really, but also that's really difficult to do, unfortunately, and especially at the EU level. So that part I still haven't solved quite myself. Um, then just very briefly to the, to the war of attack on Ukraine. Um, I think that I mean, of course, it has had a huge impact on on everything and on also the political discussion and everything. And to some extent, especially in the beginning, I think that climate change, quite understandably, was uh, not the main uh, concern because we had to just have some energy for the for the winter to come and so on. But I, I think that um, for the I, I think at least in Finland, in the Finnish discussion, I think there has been kind of this short-term thinking and long-term thinking and in in a way I, I think that the the same goals that at least in the long term that we have to do in order to sort of mitigate the impact of, the, of Russia's war on us are actually also similar uh, to, the, to the things that we have to do in order to implement the, the green transition so these objectives are actually quite uh, near to each other and in that sense I think that that maybe there is now more of an understanding also of how these different crises, war and, and climate change can also be intertwined and, and exacerbate one another. So then we also have to find solutions that will fight both at the same time. And then the final question that I will try to tackle, which is also the hardest one, I really don't have an answer to this, is the, the issue of failing to communicate. Uh, and here maybe it's good to say that I'm not really an EU scholar myself, so I don't even have to know the answer to this. But um, yeah. I mean, it, it it is surprising to me how um, maybe also because I have been following the EU's enlargement process in the in the Western Balkans, which hasn't been going too well. And I think that there is a similar issue of communication there, where actually a lot more could have been achieved, and and many sort of basic problems could have been avoided with just a bit better communication. I mean, of course, you also have to do uh, things and not just communicate. Um, and in, in fact, actually, now that I said that, I maybe that is a part of the issue that uh, that EU has a lot of these sort of grand strategies and uh, and it's declaring lots of things and declaring partnerships and so on with other countries. But then somehow the, the action there is is missing again, like like Nicholas also pointed out with the implementation. Uh, and that I don't know why is it, could it exactly be this uh, lack of uh, kind of this uh, common 
view on what to do or or is it just that there are so many different actors at play that uh, once we get to the actual ground and and we should be implementing something then the, the sort of the policy has already been changed and turned around many times or somehow that the communication doesn't really run from from the field in a way to the to the uh, like upper levels of decision making or there has to be something like that there because i think that often the the failures that the eu is making with communication are so sort of right. basic they should be quite easily avoided thank but you really thank you there. emma uh, so i have to i have to watch the time a little bit so nicholas you have five minutes to give us all the answers we just have heard the optimistic pessimist so go is you thank you thank you johannes yeah um so in, in the interest of time I'll, I'll try to be as as brief as as possible i think your 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 question uh, uh i mean it really hits hard um johannes in the sense that you kind of you ask is this really feasible what we're kind of envisioning and transitioning into one equilibrium of, of energy to to another and obviously i think anyone who says they have a very kind of uh, uh you know firm answer or, or kind of uh, to this is is obviously not necessarily uh, lying but but you know it, it, it's extremely hard to to make kind of firm predictions around this obviously but i just want to Allude, you have you have you had a look at this book? Sorry, can you read it? It's uh, it's uh, Helen Thompson's Disorder, and what she does in it, uh, it's a beautiful book in kind of, of history and, and political economy, and she makes this very crucial point that Europe's energy consumption was never sustainable, not necessarily from an environmental point of view, but from a geopolitical point of view, and that goes back. Uh, you know, before the, the Second World War and, and before the whole idea that we could kind of, you know, tame Russia through um, imports of natural gas, but the whole conundrum around, you know, how to support um, uh, Europe with, uh, with uh, fossil fuels when there's basically no fossil fuels to, have, to, to go uh, by in Europe. So the whole kind of energy um, system of, of, of Europe and many parts of Europe have been been geopolitically extremely exposed and, un, and 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 unstable for a very long time. So I think that is something that maybe we also need to kind of take into account when we discuss these these matter because uh, renewable obviously we need to do it in order to re reduce uh, emissions and and try to kind of avoid very bad outcomes in terms of of global warming. But I think there is a lot there is also a very kind of uh, you know, bare knuckle uh, geo geopolitical um, uh, question uh, at the heart too, right? Because if 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 Europe can move towards energy uh, self sufficiency through renewables, uh, it's going to be in a very different uh, position geopolitical uh, mo moving forward. So I think that needs to be be taken into account. And then, super quick, I mean, on, on terms of communication, um, you know, I haven't done any systematic studies on this, but you know, having been in in EU studies for a while. Obviously, it doesn't help that you have a very technocratic mode of governance um, at, at, at the top for, for political reasons, obviously, and for, for, for maybe good reasons. But that uh, usually kind of uh, produce very bad communi communicators and, 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 and communication from, from the EU. And the whole idea is that member states should kind of step in here. And, and most of the time, they don't. So I think that is very much part of the the, the quote unquote failure to communicate uh, on on behalf of, of of the EU. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Allow me one quick remark. I mean, Thompson's book is great, and everyone who has ever read uh, Yergin's The Price knows about this dependency at least since the late '60s, uh, where first the U.S. and then others had to come in, especially Norway, uh, to allow Europe this consumption of fossil that uh, we were depending on. And we are in the same situation now, and I'm very much wondering, and I do so in a new book on geopolitics, uh, which is in the making, you know, I wonder what are the lessons that we learned the past 50 years, because the answers seem to be always the same, but now have to be, of course, heated up due to the climate crisis. Now, uh, let's uh, go to the second block, so to say. Uh, and that's the Finnish and Swedish issues. I'm very much looking uh, forward to uh, Gunilla's input uh, here. Gunilla, please. Thank you very much, Johannes. And thank you 
all uh, for very interesting points that you have raised. I, I won't deal with them in the interest of time because now it's uh, about time to deal with the Swedish and Finnish particular issues of uh, the climate change uh, policies. So uh, above all, this is about the forestry sector. Uh, it's very much at the center for Sweden and Finland for the obvious reason that 75% of Finland and 70% of Sweden are covered by forest. And much of it is used for industrial purpose. Forest products account for 20% of the Finnish export and 12% of the Swedish one. So its importance is therefore huge. Between Sweden and Finland and, and the Commission, there are some disagreements on this particular issue. Last month, the Finnish and Swedish Prime Ministers, Petri Orpo and Ulf Kristersson, wrote a common letter to the Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, and they invited her for uh, to a visit to Finland and Sweden in which she could see and discuss how to deal with the Nordic forest, because this is an accusation from the North that they are not quite uh, capable of doing in Brussels. And at the, for at the center of this discussion is the EU's new forest strategy, which was published in July this year, and which aims to boost biodiversity, to limit the burning of trees for energy, to protect remaining old forests from logging, and to plant 3 billion new trees. The Commission claims that it has no intention to dictate the foreign policy, the, the forest policy of member countries. But according to the two prime ministers, the forest strategy, if implemented, would lead to great problems for the forest industry sector of the northern countries. If we then go to the countries themselves, we see that there are actually also in Finland and Sweden different views on this. Now I will concentrate on Sweden and Emma will comment on the Finnish reaction and the Finnish discussion. But if we, if we look at the Swedish uh, scene, we see the Green Party, which is uh, very much on the side of the Commission. We also see different organizations dealing with the uh, environment who are in the same situation. <clears throat> in particular, the critics, critics claim that the industry must move away from the practice of clear-cutting, Karl Hyggen in Swedish, in which all the trees are cut down at the same time within a certain area. And also that the trees that are planted afterwards are all of the same type. And this leads to a monoculture, they claim, which is actually true as well, destroying the biodiversity and they, it has further negative effects. It's also a demand that old trees are better kept which is also very much important for the Sami people because the reindeers feed from the hanging lichen, the hang love in Swedish. And uh, therefore they will starve in case they don't get enough of that. But then as we understand, there are also other voices. The previous government, social democrats, democratic government, as well as the present center-right government are all on that same level, which means that the forestry sector is doing what is the most sensible policy in order to deal with the forests in this uh, region. They claim that the commission doesn't have enough uh, knowledge about how to do it, and also that Brussels seems to micro-regulate the Swedish forestry. And they claim the lack of knowledge is a dangerous issue for the Nordic industry and very much because they don't understand the variety of roles that the forest industry, forest has for the whole industry in Sweden. Uh, what they say is that the forests in Sweden function as carbon sinks while they are growing and thereafter the wood is used 
for a variety of purposes, not the way they, they claim that the Commission sees them as only carbon sinks. Wood is now replacing steel as well as concrete, also for high-rise buildings in Sweden. And uh, they replace fossil-based plastic and textiles. Bio-oil is a waste product of forestry and agriculture. Biofuel is used a lot nowadays, and they help to cut down the transport emissions. And this view is also given some support by researchers who claim that when you have clear cutting and then growing trees of the same age, the trees will absorb on average as much as 30% more carbon than if you have the traditional forestry techniques. One of the politicians, a uh, green one actually, he summarized the discussion in a way where he said, this is full of dilemmas. We need the new forestry products that are made and that are coming more and more as substitutes for plastic clothes, as for building, as for fuel, for almost every kind of product. But at the same time, we also need the biodiversity that we are sometimes sacrificing in our country. So this is about the forestry industry. And I think this is what we have been discussing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, commission more than any other subject. But there are more things happening. And one thing that is very much on the agenda lately are the heavy emissions coming from the transport sector. The transport sector emits a third of the total emissions in Sweden. In the goal that was set in 2017 for this sector, the goal the, the aim was that by 2030, the emissions should be lowered by 70% compared to 2010. And a person like Johan Rockström, who is more known than anyone else in this uh, field in Sweden, says that this is the crucial point. If you make compromises on this, you are in a very bad situation. But this is what was suggested actually by the present government. Uh, they have now reduced the taxes on diesel and petrol, and they have also lowered the reduction obligations of these fuels. And this means also according to the government that the goal that I mentioned will not be reached. However, what I read in the newspaper today is that now the European Union has reacted to this. It is now a political issue and actually, I wouldn't be able to say at this stage what will happen to these suggestions. Maybe there will be a considerable change considering the EU demand that you have to go down every year in emissions. You can't say that we'll have heavy emissions until 2030 and then something will happen that will reduce them quickly. This is not to be done according to the EU. and. Uh, I think these words will be uh, very much part of the discussion and we'll see how it goes. But even the president, the present uh, government is not compromising with the ultimate goal. I must emphasize that the Swedish goal of being a totally climate neutral by 2045 still remains. And uh, I find it very difficult to think that any government in Sweden would go back on that they would have to do other things. So Nila, uh, thank you. Let's let's stop here uh, so that we also give Emma an opportunity to yep. talk a little bit about the Finnish industrial policy before we have a, a last q and if that is okay for you. Very good. Emma, please. Thank you. And thank you, Gunilla, for the, the really interesting uh, discussion on forestry and forestry policy in, in Sweden. Uh, I think it's also in interesting from the Finnish point of view, because I think, uh, as you mentioned, it's also a really huge discussion in, in Finland, but there also are some differences there. And I think that the main reason that uh, in Finland, uh, the forestry sector has been so important in the climate discussion 
is that it's actually a really important part of our uh, climate neutrality target, which actually in Finland we uh, aim to be climate neutral by 2035. And I think a part of that has been that we have relied quite a lot on the uh, on the carbon sink uh, in our forests, but then this has now been kind of um, put into uh, a new perspective as we have new information that um, that the carbon sink in the in the forests has been eroding or er eroded. It has been falling uh, for the past uh, years, uh, and now actually, I think last year for the first time, because of this uh, reduction in the carbon sink in the forests, our land use sector was for the first time a, a source of carbon rather than a carbon sink. Now I think it's it's back this this year or or the previous year, but. Uh, it, it has been now back to being uh, a sink, but only by a slight margin. And actually in the neut climate neutrality target, we relied on a rather huge um, uh, carbon sink uh, in, the, in the land use sector. So now uh, this really puts a lot of pressure uh, on, on Finland and its, its climate targets. Um, first of all, it, it might mean that we have to uh, buy these um, these kinds of kind of sink uh, carbon sinks uh, or carbon sink units from other EU countries, and it's still very unclear how how that would uh, what the meca mechanism is and how much that would cost, uh, but probably a lot. <laughs> um, and then it also means that we have to find the the uh, the reductions or in, in the emissions elsewhere in, in other sectors like for example on transportation and, and so on and that also is, is not easy I, I think that one reason that we relied so much on the on carbon sink in the forests is that the other sectors are quite difficult um, and as Gunilla said uh, in in in, uh, in the Swedish case you had a change of government uh, and so have we in Finland and, and the policies of this uh, present government are very different uh, than the previous one. The previous one was very uh, ambitious on uh, climate targets, although perhaps uh, we didn't quite achieve all the, all the policies and all the plans that were actually uh, initially in the government program. Uh, the current government has a very different uh, point of view and climate is really not prioritized, but like in Sweden, uh, also we have not given up on the on the main target um, of climate neutrality, even though it's a very ambitious uh, target, even by global standards. Uh, and I think here uh, again, uh, I hate to repeat myself, but I think that uh, one issue that will now become very crucial is the exactly the uh, the, the issue of coordination between the different. Um, different industries and, and different industrial sectors. Uh, I think one example of how we have maybe in the past uh, failed on it a little bit is, is that we have these um, sort of sectoral roadmaps for different industries uh, for achieving the climate neutrality target that were made during the previous government. Uh, and, and those are quite uh, good to have and ambitious, but the, the roadmaps have not been coordinated with one another. So again, the, the sort of targets and the, and the tasks uh, are sometimes uh, in, um, in controversy with one another. Uh, and I think that it would be really important to have this one shared uh, understanding of what we, what are the actions that we need in different sectors and how we can also, because I think for for example, energy production, we will need many different solutions that then have to be fit together and, and how we can use different industries and, and different uh, producers, for example, in the, in the forestry sector. Those kinds of questions will become very important and especially more important if, if we are now even in a more difficult place with uh, achieving our targets. So I think that we should really have a, a bigger discussion about um, rather than just kind of blaming the EU uh, for uh, strict policies, we should, ha should have this internal discussion about how we actually achieve the, the goals that we now have. Thank you. Emma, many thanks. Uh, uh, also, thank you very much, uh, Gunilla. Uh, let's start a little bit of discussions about those uh, topics that we have touched upon now. And I have to admit, Gunilla, when I, I was listening to you, I was thinking, yeah, every member state claims to be special. Yeah. 
we claim to be special, not only in the sense that we are producing the best pastry, we also claim we need more help from the EU because we have all those bloody mountains in Austria, which you don't have up there. Yeah. So how far is this kind of prime minister invites van der Leyen to come to Sweden and count trees, see for herself? I'm pretty sure they know in the commission how many trees there are in Scandinavia. It seems to be more a discussion between forestry experts about natural rejuvenation, about changing forestry as such. And that's a discussion that we have since 1400, 1500, uh, couple of hundreds of years already, you know, about how do we replenish, so to say, what we take out. And it doesn't seem that you in the North have been taking out more than you replenish. So the issue must be somewhere else. And thereby that leads me to what Emma has said. It, it's astounding for me to hear when you say, oh, we haven't had any coordination or not enough coordination between the industrial sectors. So I'm wondering, and I'm sure this is not only the case in Finland or Sweden. I'm, I'm sure that is across uh, the member states. Wondering, is the political elite somehow surprised about the climate issue being a topic nowadays? Is that the first time they are hearing about it? Are they so helpless that they revert to this kind of symbolic politics, inviting van der Leyen to Scandinavia, telling them how important forests are? I think, I think you have the same issue in Bulgaria and Romania which are the second biggest exporters, so to say, when it comes to forest products. Yeah. So what, what's going horribly, horribly wrong here? You know, that I, I want to understand because if we don't understand that, and this time you can't say, Emma, that you are not an EU expert when it comes to communication. What has gone wrong that this coordination hasn't happened so far? Is that the ever-changing governments? Well, thankfully we live in a democracy and that's how it is. So what is it? We always have the pendulum swinging a little bit, okay? One government being more green, the next government a little bit less green. I think the time is past that we can afford this kind of nonsense, okay? Because when we talk about 3% increase of warming, it's going to be disastrous, not only for the Scandinavian forests. So whoever wants to come in, please uh, let me know. What's so special about Scandinavia and uh, what's so special about Finland and, and Sweden um, that makes you different from other member states? And it can't be the number of trees. Gunilla, if you want to start. Okay, I can start here. Well, actually in Sweden, the number of trees are growing. So it, it's not a matter of getting less carbon uh, sinks because of a reduction of trees. I think uh, a main issue here is that the total forestry industry would have to be restructured if we have uh, a different kind of uh, industry with less clear cuttings. And that is about, uh, uh, I think the industry is honest when they say that you can't do this restructuring without reducing the number of uh, uh, output that you get from the forest. So for them, it's uh, in that case, a matter simply of money. Uh, it would be painful to have uh, less output and less uh, revenues from the forest. Uh, of course, you can also say that uh, we in the North are a bit uh, uh, reluctant to take uh, ideas from other countries they uh, you, you see that in in some of the remarks when they say that you don't understand the way we do it and uh, I, I can't judge whether they understand it or not but I, I do understand that the industry is worried about having a, a, a new policy uh, what I think is very much at the core of the Swedish discussion is that people do take biodiversity seriously, but they also take new technology seriously. And uh, this is something that I haven't mentioned. The fact that <clears throat> the new technology is relying on forest to a very high degree and uh, needs to have the kind of forestry that we have, uh, policy that we have at the moment. 
it's not only about forestry. The new technology is about many things, but forestry comes into it. So I think there are there are many issues that uh, come together in the forestry de debate in Sweden. Thank you, Gunilla. I mean, I was just thinking, I mean, I can't know that I'm coming from a family, forestry family. I was just thinking about Stora Enso, this, this huge company. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Swedish and Finnish as far as mm -hmm. I remember. Yeah. I'm sure they know about the restructuring because they are stock listed and they're doing that already. They are trying to diversify in their output in order not to face the repercussions that you uh, mentioned uh, about. Okay, Stora Enzo is, by the way, also a company that is uh, having huge holdings in Bulgaria and Romania. So I wonder always aren't those companies far ahead from what we observe is happening uh, in uh, politics. And what you said, Gunilla, the restructuring also points to what Emma has said beforehand. There is a certain cultural dimension. The way we have done things might not be staying the same. Yeah. And and I do think that the younger, younger generation, that's their right, their privilege, have understood that much better. But just think about for one second about our profession flying around half the globe to deliver papers for 30 minutes. I think this has come to an, it needs to come to an end too. As much, Nicholas, as I enjoy the personal interactions, but I think it's no longer responsible. But but Emma, a question to you was about the, the failure to coordinate the different industrial sectors and who should do that? Yeah, that's also again a dif difficult question. Um, and I mean, of course, I'm not saying that there hasn't been, uh, as you also mentioned, it's not like there hasn't been any coordination, but but perhaps not not enough. Um, I I think it is in part maybe related also to the uh, issue of um, what Gunilla said that that in a way uh, that no sector kind kind of completely or no business completely wants to. Um, stop what it's it's doing and completely restructure it somehow and build from from nothing and of course coordination as such wouldn't necessarily need it but the but sometimes the if these uh, uh if these uh, sort of actions are coordinated pro properly and then they are uh, these different industries are expected to actually implement them we would again be there that that they would need to considerably change, for example, what they are producing at the moment. Uh, but in Finland, the problem with the forestry sector is also that I think we have been uh, producing quite low value added products. And of course, it would make sense for the for the industry to develop what it's producing. But I think that also will then require a lot of investment, which uh, at least when the forestry industry was doing quite badly uh, during some years, uh, there was a lot of reluctance and also inability, like quite quite uh, genuinely, to to invest on on new products. Uh, so there is an element of of that. And then maybe, uh, even though in Finland, I would also argue that there is an understanding of how serious climate change is and that we really need to act on it and so on. But it's still kind of seen as something slightly separate from. It. It's not like the main. For example, objective of uh, the Finnish uh, industrial strategy, or or a strategy of of some specific firm, for example, and I don't know if it should be, but but it's still often seen as something that we do on the side of other things, um, and I think that that then means that the changes that we can achieve are incremental, and that also leads us to kind of consider these actions from a very sort of narrow point of view what we can what can we do in our industry in order to achieve these specific targets for un, our industry and therefore uh, there is a lack of coordination and then to the question of who should do that coordination of course i i guess uh, the obvious answer would be the state i know that that maybe sounds ominous and bad to some people that we, we would have this like state controlled economy and that's not what i'm arguing at all uh, but of course because the state is also the 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 par party who can, uh, for example, implement incentives and so on, so that there should be at least maybe more coordination, coordination from the state's side. But 
I understand that there are sensitivities with that. So uh, I'm not yeah, in any way proposing a complete state controlled transition. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Niklas, I want to bring you back in because e Emma was very careful not to say the state needs to do that. Who else can do it? I mean, we know what happens if we rely on voluntary coordination between industry sectors. It, it's not going to happen because they are structured according to a different logic. And the logic for stock listed companies is, of course, not the one that has the climate agenda high on the priority list. So is there anything you can think about uh, who should step in there, apart from, by the way, the European Commission? Sure. No, I, I, I think you're right in that sense. But um, And this maybe ties back to what we kind of started uh, our discussion in, kind of the, the increased awareness around the limits of kind of the EU, if you kind of allow yourself to be a little bit kind of simplify stuff and, and, and go big in a sense that kind of the, 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 the EU model of, of doing climate action is, is very heavy on, on regulation and not so much on, on stimulation or, or kind of um, uh, basically throwing money or at, 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 at kind of uh, uh, certain sectors. So, I mean, wouldn't that be something also to be explored here, right? I think you're absolutely right by pointing out, look, who are the big players, for instance, when it comes to Swedish and, and, and the Finnish forestry sectors, the Sturenso and, and, and others, obviously, these kind of, of big actors, they respond to stimulus, like any any actors, right? So obviously, you know, there's definitely a role for, for states to, to regulate markets, but there's also a, a, a big role for, 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 for states to kind of steer um, uh, in investments uh, or Kind of trying to shift or or usher in a new equilibrium in terms of you know how we do, for instance, uh, forestry policy or or, or kind of or, or coordination, and if if that is what we're talking about. So I think that there is there is obviously more ways to think about you know what we can do with uh, state commission or call it you know the, the the public side of of the of the equilibrium. Thank you, Nicholas. Gonilla, I want to give you the. Final word before I close. So, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, now about the forestry, w what I believe firmly is that this is an issue that will sort itself out. I uh, see in the words of the two uh, prime ministers, they talk about, we'll see the implementation of this. It, it's not It's not the kind of problem that will is not solvable. I think there are many worse problems when, when we come to how people need to change their lives. In Sweden, we have been very eager. We have put up the solar panels. We have bought electric cars and so on. And I think people have got a certain joy out of it, but I think there are much, much worse things coming if we want really to follow the advice of the scientists. And that's where we will have the real problems in the climate change, not in the forestry. That will take care of itself one way or the other. So I, I'm ending on a rather happy note then, when it comes to forestry at least, but not for the rest of the climate change. That is problematic. Uh, thank you very much, Gunilla. I think we are, we are right on time. I have to extend special thanks to Gunilla because when you were talking, I was reminded of my youthful hikes in Sweden, by the way, also in Finland. And you know, the one thing that bothered me most were the mosquitoes. So you reminded <laughs> me of that. Many thanks for that. I also want to thank Emma and Niklas. Uh, this is an ongoing discussion. Um, we will meet again in one or the other way. Uh, this is a topic that is going to stay not only with us, but with the next generations. Uh, I do think that change starts with the individual, and we all have to work on that, I do think. But many, many thanks for this interesting exchange of thoughts, and I wish you all the best for the Scandinavian winter. Uh, stay warm. Thank you so much, and goodbye, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you, everyone.